Hello, so uh, it seems that uh, we are live. Please let me know if you can hear me and uh, see my screen sharing. So if everything is fine, I'm going to start today's lecture on uh, lessons learned from word embeddings and uh, also discuss how we can uh, obtain uh, document embeddings that can be useful for um, classifying uh, documents by various, uh, uh, let's say, tasks such as opinion mining, categorization by topic, subjectivity and objectivity, and uh, I don't know other uh, other ways to classify documents. Um, so today we're going to discuss about the relationship of uh, deep learning approaches for word embedding and previous works and show what are the, the improvements of the neural embeddings and then we are also going to present uh, ways to, to obtain document embeddings, some that are based on um, uh, deep learning and some that I, are based on other algorithms. So the, um, the main motivation for presenting uh, other algorithms than deep learning is that uh, these obtain good uh, results in practice. Okay, so uh, I'm still waiting for a confirmation in the chat before I start uh, the lecture. So I just try to, to do a brief introduction. But uh, yeah, I will not start uh, the presentation until I know that everything is okay. Maybe the delay is higher than uh, it usually is, I don't know. Okay, so if I don't have any feedback, oh, it's okay. Okay, I was thinking that I have problems with my connection again. Okay, so, um, okay, today, as I said before, we're going to continue our discussion about word embeddings. And actually, the, the slides are based on this uh, paper from uh, transactions of uh, ACL. Um, which was published by uh, a group of, uh, let's say, renowned authors in uh, computational linguistics. So um, they try to, to see uh, what are the lessons that should be learned from uh, word embeddings uh, with respect to the previous uh, approaches. So yeah, a brief uh, recap. So uh, these methods, as well as the previous methods, are based on uh, word similarity and relatedness. And uh, for example, if you want to, to figure out how similar are two words, like pizza and pasta. So these are, let's say, different types of uh, dishes that can be served uh, in Italy. So there is also a relation to, to Italy, but um, in general, you can have uh, uh, relations um, of first order and second order, as we discussed uh, last time, but these are uh, uh, based on uh, 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 using word uh, vectorial word representations in order to, to compute similarity using the cosine similarity. So possible approaches from the previous literature is based on distributional semantics. So we can use here word, uh, word occurrence matrices or word context uh, matrices or word document matrices. And uh, these are usually uh, either based on count statistics or uh, decomposed using uh, singular value decomposition. And uh, we also have the neural approaches, uh, which are inspired by deep learning. And uh, the most popular uh, word embedding approaches are word to vec and uh, glove. So all these are based on the uh, distributional uh, hypothesis, 
that was introduced by uh, Harris and Firth in the 50s, uh, which is based on that on the fact that uh, similar words occur in a similar context. And we provided some uh, examples uh, last time. So both approaches rely on the same, uh, same linguistic theory. They use the same data documents. And uh, one uses the, the collected documents to uh, obtain uh, count statistics, while the other tries to predict words from the context. And uh, it seems that these approaches, al although they are uh, alternative approaches for um, for building word representations, it seems that uh, there is also a mathematical relation uh, between them. So this was discussed in a paper by uh, Levy at uh, um, Neorips 2014. And... Uh, they show that neural word embeddings uh, are uh, an implicit way to learn uh, to do matrix factorization. Okay, so if they use the same linguistic theory and the same data, and there is also a mathematical relation between them, we can ask ourselves how come the word embeddings provide uh, so much better results. So there are papers uh, in favor of uh, word embeddings that, uh, for example, the uh, paper of Baroni published at ACL 2014, um, which is um, uh, supporting the idea of uh, trying to predict words in context of or context of words uh, instead of uh, counting, uh, counting them. So instead of using distributional uh, semantic, uh, semantics and um, Actually, it seems that uh, the first sight is not uh, not enough to draw a conclusion. So, it, um, it there are some sub subtleties when you train uh, these word embeddings um, that actually make them better. So there are two uh, major contributions of word embeddings. We have uh, a set of novel algorithms that are based on uh, uh, objective functions and training approaches um, and. Um, here we have the Skibgram model plus negative sampling, uh, CBAO, and uh, hierarchical softmax, and other um, um, other ways of uh, uh, building these uh, these word embeddings. And uh, in the same time, we also have new hyperparameters for preprocessing and uh, postprocessing, and so on, such as uh, subsampling, dynamic context window. Um, context distribution smoothing, adding context vectors, and so on. So uh, the question is, uh, what's really improving the performance here? Uh, well, uh, is it the novel algorithms or the new hyperparameters? So um, this was the question that was uh, was uh, proposed in the. Uh, transactions of the ACL uh, journal paper that uh, these authors tried to, to address. And uh, their, their findings are actually that um, both these have some contribution in the improving the results, but I think most of it is due to the new hyperparameters and not the actual algorithms. There are only very specific cases uh, where the algorithms are indeed uh, better than the uh, count uh, count uh, approaches. Okay, so now we go into the uh, details of this approach. So the key contribution of this paper uh, is uh, first identifying the existence of these new hyperparameters, uh, which are not uh, that obvious because in many cases they are not uh, mentioned in papers and uh, you will discover them only when you look at the implementation of the code corresponding to to the papers presenting word to vec and glove and so on uh, they also adapt the hyperparameters across algorithms so once they found the they fi find these uh, hyperparameters they also try to to adapt them across uh, uh, algorithms so basically transfer the hyperparameter settings to the old algorithms um, well those that can be transferred not all the hyperparameters can be transferred but uh, some of them can and uh, we will see some interesting results 
And yeah, they also do compare the algorithms across uh, hyperparameter settings. So they do over uh, 5000 experiments in which they uh, claim to compare, to do a more um, fair comparison between uh, uh, neural algorithms and uh, count algorithms. Um, basically, they, they claim that they do an uh, uh, apples to apples comparison uh, rather than apples to oranges as before. Okay, so um, their interpretation of word to vec so we're going to do a quick recap of uh, word to vec from a slightly different uh, angle. So actually, yeah, word to vec is not, uh, not a single algorithm. It's actually uh, a software package that contains two algorithms and um, also not only that CBAO and SKIPGRAM that we introduced last time, so these are the main algorithms, but they also have uh, various training methods such as negative sampling and uh, hierarchical softmax and they also have a rich preprocessing uh, pipeline that includes dynamic context windows, uh, subsampling, deleting rare words and so on. <laughs> So all these um, uh, word to vec is actually this uh, software package that contains these uh, neural training algorithms, but also additional uh, pre-processing or post-processing steps and also additional uh, things for uh, the training. So it's more complex than, than an algorithm and it also involves these uh, hyperparameters. So we're going to to discuss in a bit more detail the skipgram model and the negative uh, sampling approach. So um, yeah, the the skipgram model with negative sampling um, is uh, works something as uh, follows. So for a word uh, in a context, uh, we first um, um, get the words in the uh, the, the word in the context and uh, um, in order to, to build this uh, um, uh, set of data, so we have the set of data D. So here we have a context window of uh, two words uh, um, to the left and two words to the right of the target word. And um, the skipgram model finds a vector V for each word in our vocabulary. So um, each, each vector has a, a Latin dimension. So for example, it can be 100, it can be 300. Uh, so usually uh, I think the optimal results are obtained with uh, 300 components. And uh, the model uh, learns a weight matrix uh, that these are the weights of the neural units whose uh, rows represent the, the word vectors uh, in the vocabulary VW. Okay, so uh, here a key point is that the model also learns uh, a similar auxiliary matrix. So one that uh, is um, denoted here by C, uh, so a matrix of context vectors. So in our previous uh, slides, we were using W and W prime and now we're using the notation uh, C um, as in the paper of uh, uh, Levy, Goldberg and uh, Dagan. Okay, so um, these matrices, the matrix uh, W has D uh, columns and uh, the number of rows is given by the number of words in the vocabulary. So we obtain an embedding here, uh, the embedding W for the word wombat which is a different, um, a different um, embedding uh, than the one obtained from this other matrix C. So this matrix uh, has a similar dimension. So this one um, decodes, so from the word, it decodes the context, okay? So um, remember that in the skipgram model we have a word as input and we obtain a set of um, the, the words in the context. Okay, so uh, here we obtain the, the context and as input you will have the, a word, uh, the target word. Okay, so um, 
these are not the same so in this example you see that uh, if you look at the first components for this uh, word in the vocabulary uh, you will learn that the word vectors are not uh, identical so these are uh, actually different embeddings for, for the same uh, for the same word okay so um, in uh, um, as we explained earlier we have this uh, um, multiplication between the uh, word and the context word C and uh, we obtain um, uh, here we want to maximize uh, the output of the sigmoid applied on the product of the two words um, given that the word C was observed uh, in the same context with W uh, so here we have the word wombat that is observed in context uh, in the same context with words like uh, furry, little, hinding and so on and we also have um, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, negative sampling approach so in order to to learn the model properly um, what is not actually uh, uh, explained uh, in the paper uh, in the original paper is that uh, they also um, uh, try to minimize uh, the uh, the sigmoid with respect to uh, a word C prime which is uh, hallucinated with W. So they, they create this um, context for which the, the answer is uh, negative. So we expect here that uh, this uh, sigmoid should minimize. So yeah, they, uh, they sample words that never appear in the same context with Wombat and they try to minimize uh, the, the sigmoid and the, the weights with respect to to this part so this part is called uh, negative sampling so um, so for um, um, for for minimizing uh, the function in the previous slide uh, they sample a number of K contexts um, and um, these are randomly sampled uh, and are uh, used as negative uh, examples and uh, in order to sample these models so here you see the word random so this means that they are using a, a unigram distribution so they uh, consider the distributions of uh, the, the uh, count of uh, uh, words from in the document and they sample uh, according to this uh, probability for the context word c so um, one important uh, aspect here is that uh, changing this distribution has a significant effect and actually they um, apply a, a slight change to this distribution that uh, improves the model by, uh, by a significant uh, margin. Okay, so uh, uh, the Skipgram model with uh, uh, negative sampling uh, takes the embedding matrices W and C and uh, if you multiply them uh, you get uh, a matrix uh, that is the the size of uh, the same size as the vocabulary where each cell describes the relation between a specific word uh, context pair so here you have the uh, the word W, the context C, and uh, each cell in this uh, result matrix uh, expresses the relation between uh, a word W and the context uh, C. So um, actually in this interpretation uh, what when and uh, okay so uh, you can uh, uh, so you can obtain this matrix of uh, relation of word context pairs by multiplying the matrices that are learned by the skipgram model so these are also the weights of the skipgram model so this is the weight of the uh, encoder and the weight of the decoder so um, this means that uh, um, the the neural word uh, embedding uh, um, 
generates an implicit matrix uh, factorization. So this was uh, discussed in uh, this paper in 2014. And um, they actually, they prove that for uh, a large enough uh, dimension, so if this D is large enough, and uh, for a sufficient number of uh, iteration while training the model, we actually obtain the word context uh, uh, matrix. Uh, well, one that is um, um, obtained by a specific method named uh, pointwise mutual information. And actually, they, uh, you do not obtain this exact matrix, but uh, the, the matrix that's, that is uh, shifted by a global con constant. So actually, you can uh, obtain the uh, matrix uh, from the pointwise mutual information uh, if you subtract uh, um, the logarithm of, uh, uh, of k. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, skip gram uh, with negative sampling. So it uh, does something very similar to the older approaches that are based on uh, singular value decomposition. So it's basically factorizing the traditional word uh, context uh, pointwise mutual information matrix. So the same thing is also done by uh, singular value decomposition. So it can be seen as an alternative way um, uh, to singular value decomposition. And uh, this was, uh, so, so far we discussed about the skip gram model used in, uh, uh, in the word to vec, but it seems that uh, GLOVE also factorizes uh, a similar word uh, context uh, matrix. Okay, so um, yeah, this this in this paper they prove that uh, there is a mathematical equivalent between neural word embeddings and uh, um, word uh, contracts uh, matrices based on uh, uh, count uh, on count statistics. And actually, in practice, we see a lot of evidence that uh, word embeddings outperform. Um, traditional methods. So there are uh, these, uh, at least these two papers from ACL and uh, EMNLP uh, 2014. And um, well, it seems that uh, the story from this uh, journal paper that we are uh, discussing now is uh, a bit uh, contradictory, but actually um, the, the, the difference or the contradiction can be explained by the fact that um, the, there is a very big impact of, of the small hyperparameters involved in, uh, in these uh, models. So now we focus on this in more detail. So word to vec and GLOVE are uh, more than just algorithms as we tried to explain before they introduce new hyperparameters. So uh, these may seem as minor changes, but they make a big difference in terms of uh, performance. So one of their, um, their first key contribution of the journal paper was to identify these new hyperparameters. So uh, for word to vec they identified uh, some pre-processing steps like uh, dynamic context windows, subsampling, and uh, deleting uh, rare words. In post-processing for GLOVE, they, uh, they uh, looked at uh, adding context vectors. And for SkipGram with negative sampling, um, they also uh, looked at the association matrix uh, so it uh, generates uh, shifted uh, PMI and um, uh, another metric um, that was considered was the context distribution uh, smoothing. So uh, we're going to discuss about two of these um, uh, hyperparameters, one that is involved in uh, pre-processing and one involved in post-processing. So uh, the first, uh, the first uh, idea, uh, dynamic context windows, was applied in uh, neural word embeddings to weight the words in the context. So here we have the target word wombat, as in um, 
uh, as in the previous um, example and we have uh, this context of four words so um, instead of uh, assigning equal weights to all the words in the context in uh, word to vec they propose to to weight um, the context by uh, how close they are to the target word so the words that are immediately to the left and right they have a weight uh, equal to one and then the weights uh, decrease to three uh, divided by four two divided by four and one divided by four so they consider uh, context of uh, four words but this can be applied uh, here in this example we have uh, four words but uh, they can be applied um, on uh, context of uh, different length and uh, in glove they used a similar idea only that um, they used uh, here the weight one to the um, words to the left and right and they uh, used um, uh, different weights uh, for the other words keeping one always uh, as the um, uh, numerator and using um, uh, the distance from the word as a denominator okay so this is uh, done in glove and there are also alternative uh, approaches uh, and here uh, this is a, a more aggressive approach where they consider um, um, powers of two uh, for the weights and uh, and so on okay so um, the post-processing step um, that is involved I also briefly um, presented it last time so in uh, in the skip gram model with negative sample we uh, we create these word vectors w and we also have the auxiliary context vectors uh, c and the same applies to glove and svd and um, actually in uh, in uh, classical approaches based on svd uh, people were just using w but um, in uh, in the skip gram model um, and uh, uh, in glove uh, the idea was to uh, to combine the two um, the two word embeddings into a single one by uh, doing a sum so this was introduced by the idea was introduced by Pennington in 2014 and it was applied to glove only so this approach also seems to bring uh, performance improvements so i uh, remember this was a post-processing step and um, now uh, so the first um, in the journal paper uh, of levy et al they identified these uh, hyperparameters and additional uh, pre-processing and post-processing steps and they also try to adapt these uh, across algorithms okay and uh, yeah one uh, one uh, last uh, change is the context distribution smoothing uh, so um, when they do negative sampling remember that they use that uh, probability um, that uh, uses the count of the word c in the context um, uh, with respect to all the uh, words in the uh, uh, vocabulary of uh, context so here we we assume that the probability is the unigram distribution and actually they uh, smooth uh, this distribution by um, uh, raising all the the counts uh, using the uh, power uh, 0 0.75 so this is equivalent to uh, raising the c to the power of 3 and uh, using a square root of uh, order 4 to obtain the final uh, output so this gives us a smooth uh, smooth uh, unigram distribution and uh, this change seems to to bring uh, 
a big difference and uh, it can also be adapted to the context distribution smoothing used in the pointwise mutual information um, word context matrix so um, there you can simply replace um, uh, the probability pc with uh, uh, with the smoothed um, uh, distribution so in in this approach uh, in the pointwise mutual um, uh, information you use uh, the logarithm of the uh, uh, probability uh, of the words uh, w and c um, divided by the probability of the word w and the probability of the context and here they update this probability with the smooth one so uh, this seems to improve this uh, uh, the pointwise mutual information uh, on every task so this is a change that was adapted from neural word embeddings to uh, this baseline approach and it seems to be uh, able to obtain uh, better better results so it seems that this idea is always useful uh, irrespective of the uh, algorithm that we employ so now uh, after they uh, adapted these hyperparameters they try to provide a more uh, compre uh, comprehensive uh, comparison of the algorithms and one that is also more uh, fair so they uh, have uh, a set of controlled experiments um, in which they uh, consider these uh, hyperparameters that uh, seems uh, seem to have been um, um, missed in previous works. So pre uh, the prior works were unaware of these uh, hyperparameters when they conducted the comparisons. So essentially, they compared uh, or at least Levy et al. Uh, claims that the previous works compared uh, apples to oranges. So um, they. Uh, in their work, they allowed every algorithm to use uh, every hyperparameter as long as the hyperparameter uh, could be transferred. So they um, um, design a systematic set of experiments considering uh, nine har uh, hyperparameters, uh, six that are new for uh, um, for these models, and um, they also uh, cons consider uh, four approaches in their comparison, including the pointwise um, um, mutual information uh, with different uh, ways to compute it, well, one based on SVD and one based on a um, different uh, approach based on uh, sparse. Uh, algorithms and they also consider uh, the skip gram model with negative sampling and uh, glove so um, they also have uh, eight um, benchmarks to, to eight uh, data sets to um, obtain uh, to compare the results and uh, six of them are based on word uh, similarity tasks and they also have two uh, tasks for analogy and in total, they performed over 5,000 experiments. And uh, so they, they consider uh, um, the uh, two hyperparameter settings where they have the vanilla setting, uh, which means this, these are the commonly used uh, distributional baselines. So in, uh, in the distributional baselines, there is no pre-processing or post-processing and um, the association metric is based on a, a vanilla uh, pointwise mutual information and um, they also consider the recommended setting for word to vec which is tuned for uh, skip gram negative sampling so for pre-processing they use dynamic context windows and subsampling um, they do not use anything for post-processing and for uh, the association metric they use context uh, uh, distribution uh, smoothing um, okay so um, these are the 
the the the baselines so one one is related to let's say comparing apples to apples and the other comparing oranges to oranges so yeah in the prior art they were comparing the vanilla setting for the uh, distributional approach uh, and the um, uh, this um, let's say uh, uh, adapted setting for word to vec so um, there was uh, an improvement here uh, considering the the baseline but uh, when you compare apples to apples, so if you consider here the vanilla setting to uh, the skip gram model, uh, the improvement is not as high, so these are uh, more close to each other. And when you consider the, uh, the hyperparameters from word to vec and apply them to the uh, baseline that is uh, not based on neural networks, you obtain uh, uh, you seems, it seems that you obtain a, an even better results. So, um, yeah, if you try to uh, optimize uh, the settings uh, for each of the two approaches, um, you obtain here in the optimal setting, uh, you obtain slightly worse results than uh, with PPMI. So overall, it seems that the two approaches are... Um, equivalent not uh, not that different from uh, from each other um, okay so yeah this is a more fair comparison and if you uh, look at these results um, so initially you are comparing this setting with this setting and the more fair comparison is to compare the vanilla setting with the vanilla setting here or the word to vec setting with the word to vec setting uh, also adjusted for uh, PBMI or if you allow them to um, do grid search for the optimal setting you obtain these results so um, yeah the differences are not uh, as high as uh, thought before um, yeah another observation here is, is this is are uh, these are based on uh, a grid search so for each method you obtain uh, different settings so um yeah the in the overall results they they found that uh hyperparameters uh, have a stronger effect than the algorithms so most of the improvements are due to hyperparameters um they even have stronger effects than using more data so um, if you uh, adjust the hyperparameters properly uh, it can uh, save you in cases when you don't have enough uh, data to train your model on and um, they conclude that uh, prior superi superiority claims of neural networks and uh, neural uh, embeddings were not uh, accurate and uh, they uh, re-evaluated the previous claims so in uh, in this paper by Baroni et, La et al they claim that word to vec is better than count based methods so um, actually the the right conclusion is that the hyperparameter settings account for most of the reported gaps so it's not the algorithm that provides better results it's just that the hyperparameter settings that were introduced along with it uh, help the model obtain better results um, the embeddings do not really outperform count based methods so they obtain uh, similar results there seems to be only one exception, which is uh, for um, for one of the methods. Uh, so now the other claim uh, that glove is better than word to vec. This was also uh, uh, the paper that introduces glove. So it seems that the the gap once again is uh, explained by. Um, using better hyperparameters than the algorithm itself so um, it seems that the improvement is due to the adding context vectors uh, which was applied only to glove um, and also a different uh, pre-processing so actually uh, when they transfer the hyperparameters between uh, word to vet and glove they observe uh, the opposite. So it seems that GLAV obtained results only because of uh, better hyperparameter settings. And uh, the actual algorithm is uh, seems to be slightly worse. 
So uh, skip gram with negative sampling up outperform uh, glove on every task they considered. And um, yeah, they used uh, the larger, uh, the largest corpus in their experiment uh, at uh, 10 billion tokens. So um, they um, they claim this uh, is valid at least for uh, lower vocabularies. So for a larger corpora, perhaps uh, things could have a different behavior. But at least on what they tested, they obtained better results with uh, Skipgram. Uh, from war to vec then with uh, glove okay so um, yeah the conclusions are uh, that the, the approaches are not that different and they also have this uh, comparison of uh, uh, th this prior work where they sh show that uh, uh, these distributional semantics uh, vectors based on uh, uh, PPMI are um, uh, actually uh, equivalent to SGNS on analogy tasks. So this uh, this holds for semantic analogies, and uh, there seems to be an exception for syntax syntactic analogies. And they um, noticed that uh, on uh, on a specific data set uh, MSR. So um, yeah, most of the uh, reported gaps are due to the hyperparameters. Um, so if you use a different uh, context type for uh, PPMI vectors, um, but the syntactic uh, for syntactic analogies, it seems that there is a real gap in favor of uh, SGNS. So in uh, conclusion, um, the contributions of word to vector uh, word embeddings are novel algorithms and new hyperparameters. And what's really improving the performance, uh, it's uh, the hyperparameters, at least in most uh, scenarios. And uh, the algorithms are uh, an improvement, at least in, uh, um, in uh, syntactic analogies. And uh, overall, it seems that the uh, Skipgram model with negative sampling is also robust and efficient. So um, there is at least an improvement in terms of uh, processing time. So yeah, the, the, the main uh, uh, takeaway is that uh, in the end, we can use neural word embeddings. Uh, we have to carefully tune the hyperparameters for these models and um, uh, we expect that we can train them more efficiently, and um, uh, but we can obtain similarly equal, equally good results with uh, previous uh, methods based on uh, a singular value decomposition or other um, machine uh, learning algorithms that are not uh, from the family of deep learning models. Okay, so uh, yeah, regarding the methodology, as I tried to explain before, so you look for uh, hyperparameters, you try to uh, adapt them, uh, and uh, for good results, uh, you definitely need uh, tuning. And um, they also have a conclusion uh, of their uh, their work. So this is a, maybe a, uh, a signal for the previous methods that didn't uh, perform uh, the comparisons uh, in a fair uh, way. So for good science, they um, they claim that it is fair to tune the baselines uh, hyperparameters uh, as well. So, um, but even with these uh, drawbacks, um, these uh, word embeddings became very popular and uh, people are very uh, happy uh, with um, with the results in, in practice, but yeah, you um, yeah you really need to to think and look at the results, and um, yeah, despite their success, so they have some merit, but uh, perhaps it was a bit uh, um, exaggerated by the scientific community. Okay, so this ends the first part of our discussion with lessons learned from word embeddings. So next we're going to present uh, various ways to obtain uh, document embeddings. Um, 
Okay, so I'm stopping now to see uh, to, to try to answer this question. So, um, okay, so I think think that the metric is uh, PMI so the association metric for both methods is uh, is PMI so this is to answer me hi um, okay so at least in their experiments so yeah maybe in the original paper they uh, used uh, maybe they also used the uh, peers Pearson correlation is an alternative way. Um, okay, so let's uh, jump to document embeddings. Um, okay, so so far we discussed about uh, ways to to obtain um, vectorial representations for words. So uh, now we uh, what we want to do is to obtain these. Um, representations for documents uh, so we can use these representations for example in uh, classification models for uh, various uh, classification uh, document classification tasks okay so the first uh, first idea uh, could be to take the average of word uh, vectors uh, in a document and uh, use that to to represent the document so this uh, this idea was used in the uh, continuous bag of words model or SIBO uh, that was uh, introduced with word to vec and it was used uh, as a, a way to obtain the or to predict the word in a given even a given context so you take the words in a context you average the word embeddings and from that average, you try to predict the word in the context. And this idea of averaging the word embeddings can also work for uh, a document. And uh, sometimes this approach is called the average of word embeddings or also the continuous bag of words model. Um, and this is kind of similar to the bag of words. So it has the same uh, disadvantage. It loses the, uh, the order uh, of um, words in the context so uh, when you compute the average of word uh, word to vex uh, the the sentences man bites a dog or dog bites a man um, are the same and also applies to longer sentences and so on okay so uh, starting from this uh, problem uh, the, the first um, uh, first question that arises is how we can model the text uh, the text uh, structure along with the word meanings so the average of word embeddings keeps the word uh, the meanings of the words in the context um, but it doesn't uh, model the text uh, structure so the first idea in this regard was to uh, was proposed uh, by uh, uh, by Le in this paper uh, by Le and Mikolov in this uh, 2014 paper where they introduced uh, the approach called paragraph vector. So this is a um, direct extension of the word to vec model to to the text level. So uh, it also based on uh, uh, two models. Uh, one based on uh, Skipgram and one based on Sibau and it changes the word to vec uh, model by adding a paragraph vector as the, the input. So you still have the words in the context in the paragraph and try to predict the target word but here you also use um, uh, a paragraph vector as input and the same uh, applies to the uh, skip uh, uh, skip gram model so here you have the paragraph matrix and you try to predict the words in the context 
Okay, so this was the first uh, first approach. Um, another idea was proposed in this um, Neurips 2015 paper, um, and the approach is called the uh, skip thought vector, and this is a more uh, elaborate extension. So um, in this approach, they use uh, sequence to sequence recurrent neural networks. So recall that we introduced this model for. Um, neural machine translation. So here they tried to apply the same idea, but instead of trying to uh, translate one sentence from a language into another sentence in a different language, they just try to predict the next sentence or the previous sentence uh, from the current one. So they apply this uh, recurrent neural network that encodes the sentence and then in the final state, this uh, the, the sentence is encoded, and um, then they try to predict uh, the sentence that uh, comes after this one. So um, yeah, the output state vector uh, of of this um, of this state forms the uh, sentence embedding. Um, the units here are actually. Um, gated recurrent units uh, so these are uh, um, simplified uh, version of uh, lstm cells um, and once the network is trained we can discard these uh, these parts and we just use uh, this part of the uh, rnn model to to obtain the embedding for a sentence so here yeah j, j, they have this um, uh, binary decision so is this the next sentence or the other so um, yeah the the this was this model was introduced in this neorips uh, 14 paper so um, one important thing here is that this is a true uh, recurrent uh, network so uh, it doesn't uh, once you train the model the encoding part doesn't require backpropagation so you can have as many unfolding steps as you want, uh, which means that you can represent uh, sentences um, that can have uh, any number of uh, words. Okay, so this seems to, to give uh, better results than paragraph vector. It's a more uh, a better way of, uh, of uh, obta obtaining um, document embeddings. And um, yeah, they uh, they um, tested this approach um, on on a data set, uh, considering uh, or trying to estimate the uh, semantic uh, relatedness uh, between sentences. And here we have an, uh, examples of sentences with their relatedness scores. So if the sentences um, may have some words in common, but uh, are about uh, different things so a man is jumping into an empty pool and here there is no biker jumping in the air so they have the word jumping in common so there is some small relatedness here um, and um, for high relatedness scores it's um, the, the the sentence uh, tries to um, is an alternative way to express the same thing or the same idea so in this case, a person in a black jacket is doing tricks on a motorbike or a man in a black jacket, uh, black jacket is doing tricks on a motorbike has a relatedness score close to, to 5. So um, the score is exactly 5 if the sentences are identical and the score is 1 if they have no words in common. Okay, so uh, once they train the skip thought vectors, then a separate model uh, is uh, trained in a supervised way to predict the scores from pairs of uh, embedded sentences. So um, most of the models, so the embedding is uh, uh, trained in an unsupervised way, so it doesn't require any, uh, any supervision and they obtain uh, very good uh, results that are very close to uh, that were very close to the state of the art at the time uh, which is based on dependency tree lstms but these are uh, trained end-to-end -end. and while this has a, 
unsupervised uh, uh, component, the skip dot vectors, and only then only um, uh, uh, regression uh, is uh, applied on top of the um, skip dot vectors to do the final predictions, and uh, the results are uh, pretty pretty good. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, another approach um, is based. So the the following approaches are based on uh, um, um, ways or methods that are are based on uh, word embeddings. Uh, sorry. Um, so th they start from word embeddings, but uh, these are uh, handcrafted approaches. So the first approach is um, was. Uh, presented by uh, our group at uh, uh, CAS 2017 and then um, extended and applied to um, automated essay scoring at ACL 2018. And this approach uh, um, uh, seems to surpass uh, other uh, deep learning approaches that try to uh, either model the problem in an end-to-end -end fashion or uh, try to produce um, document uh, document level embeddings. Okay, so uh, for this approach uh, we took inspiration from the bag of visual words model and uh, in the bag of visual words model so we do a short detour so you want to identify some repetitive patterns that can be observed in images and uh, we know that in images these atomic patterns are not identical in all the locations because of uh, uh, various illumination changes um, uh, affine transformations and uh, and so on so yeah, the, the bag of words for an image uh, should contain uh, representative patterns that um, uh, appear uh, for a repeated number of times in, um, in the image. And um, uh, a visual word should, uh, should express a group of uh, these uh, similar but uh, not necessarily identical local image patterns. So um, in order to obtain these visual words, we uh, we use uh, k-means clustering. So, uh, for example, if we take the set of images and we um, try to sample patches from these images and apply k-means on top of it, we obtain these uh, centroids that represent um, yeah various. Uh, uh, visual words that appear uh, in these uh, images. So um, in the classical visual bag of visual words approach, we extract these uh, features from images. So instead of patches, we try to extract some uh, descriptors. Then we apply k-means clustering and we obtain these clusters with different colors. And then we go over the image and try to find uh, where each uh, descriptor um uh, to, yeah to trying to to see uh uh to which cluster we should assign each descriptor and after we do the cluster assignments of the descriptors we can build a histogram representation for this image so for the bag of super word embeddings we uh, replaced uh, the image descriptors with word embeddings and try to apply the same idea so uh, the the we know that word embeddings project uh, semantically related words in the same region of the embedding space but they are not projected into the exact same region so we want to uh, to have these larger con concepts that express uh, let's say a set of related words and uh, we can cluster the word vectors in order to obtain um, relevant semantic clusters of words. So, for example, if we have these words in, uh, in the embedding space and we apply a clustering on top of it, we obtain these, uh, uh, these clusters that contain uh, semantically related words. 
So the main advantage when we do this, uh, we can deal easily with out of domain words. So imagine that these are the words that are seen um, in the training data and you obtain these clusters and um, you can still uh, have a good representation of a document um, that does not have these exact words but have uh, has words that uh, fall inside uh, these clusters. So uh, this representation, the bag of super words embedding is good with dealing uh, with uh, uh, out of distribution um, uh, words. <clears throat> so the approach is similar to the bag of visual words. There are some slight changes here. So we have these input documents that are um, that is tokenized. So the document is tokenized. Each token um, is passed through word to vec in order to obtain these word embeddings. Then these are uh, clustered with uh, k means and we take the centroids here in order to to find uh, then how each uh, word embedding belongs to each centroid and then we build a histogram representation just as for the bag of visual words representation so um, the the main pipeline is the same the only change is here so the input we have documents and instead of image descriptor, we, uh, we use uh, word embeddings. Um, yeah, and another idea was to uh, use uh, separate clusters for each class. So um, you can take the documents and build uh, vocabularies uh, that, is, that are class dependent and build a representation for each class. And then uh, we can um, uh, we can sum up uh, or actually we can concatenate uh, the yeah the, the approach that we actually used was to concatenate the corresponding representation for each uh, uh, clustering so here the idea was to disentangle the words uh, that are semantically related but belong to different classes so this could uh, we saw that this can bring uh, some performance improvements. Um, okay, so yeah, in the standard approach, we have a single vocabulary for the entire collection and uh, to use separate clusters means that we're building one vocabulary for each class. So here, this representation can grow uh, with the number of classes. So in this case, we had to reduce the number of words um, of uh, cluster centroids per class in order to not increase uh, the uh, number of components by too much. Okay, so um, experiments were uh, performed on two data sets, the movie review and the uh, Reuters. So here we have sentiment analysis and text classification by topic. And uh, we uh, first look at uh, various uh, uh, results with various kernel uh, uh, functions uh, that uh, are applied on top of the uh, bag of super word embeddings and also results with uh, various uh, number of vocabulary. So on movie review, you have two classes. So uh, yeah, we here we considered uh, um, uh, vocabularies for one class with 5,000 words and 10,000 words and then for two classes using 5,000 words. So these two should be uh, equivalent in size. So uh, and you see here, so for these two you obtain a slight uh, improvement uh, if you use individual vocabulary for the two classes. And uh, yeah, if you increase slightly the vocabulary size, you obtain some further improvements. And we also compare with other bag of, so compared with a baseline bag of words um, that is not based on word embeddings, we see some uh, significant improvements here. So this is the bag of words um, introduced by Pang et al. And this is uh, our uh, reproduction of this bag of words. And it seems that uh, we got some slight improvements here, but still 
the representation based on bag of words is uh, is better and the same uh, applies to the Reuters corpus so here we have 90 categories so in the approach where we have a single vocabulary from the entire collection we use 10,000 or uh, two, uh, uh, 20,000 words in the vocabulary in the so this is this is the number of clusters in k-means and when we use the individual um, vocabularies uh, for each category so we have 90 categories so we reduced the number of uh, k-means clusters to 100 and 200 respectively so this gives us a dimension of uh, 9000 here which is equivalent with uh, roughly this one and here we have um, a dimension of um, 18,000 uh, so this is 9000 and 18,000 Okay, and we also have the comparison with the baseline bow, and we also have a uh, bag of words, and we also have some uh, some improvements uh, here on this data set. And uh, later we also apply this model to uh, automated essay scoring, and this approach is useful in automated essay scoring because it can capture uh, language uh, diversity pretty well. Um, it cannot capture uh, grammatical or spelling errors because um, in at least in these baseline approaches like word to vec you do not have embeddings for uh, for misspelled words so these words are simply ignored and uh, in order to capture the misspellings we combine this approach with uh, string kernels and um, yeah this is a brief uh, brief recap of string kernels which was introduced in practical machine learning last year so for two strings you just measured um, the number of uh, common uh, uh, character n-grams so for two strings s and t uh, you first build uh, some hash maps with uh, uh, the number of uh, the, the n-gram um, as key and the number of occurrences as uh, the associated value and then um, you can uh, uh, iterate through one of the hashes and uh, as you iterate through it you search for the keys in the other hash and if you find them there you can uh, simply update your count of the model so um, uh yes yeah, so, okay so here we have uh, the distance is is simply the euclidean distance we don't have any anything else okay so um uh yeah so we didn't try uh, other distances for k means so we used as for the image descriptors we used the euclidean distance Okay, so uh, yeah, so I explained how we compute the intersection string kernel, for example, is equivalent to the minimum between the uh, occurrences of the n-gram v in the hash maps s and t. So the advantage is that you can search for these uh, n-grams in con constant time in the hash maps, and um, there can be computed uh, the string kernel can be computed pretty fast. So the experiments were performed on the Automated Student Assessment Prize um, or ASAP dataset, which is actually composed on, uh, of eight subsets, each having a different number of uh, essays and uh, scores ranging in different intervals. Um, and we compared with um, the human level performance. So uh, this was the, uh, the actually the overlap. That, so there were two human annotators and this is the overlap um, uh, between the human annotators. So this can be regarded as, uh, I don't know, the um, uh, ground truth for, for humans. Uh, or an upper bound that we would like to, to obtain with our models and uh, we compare with uh, methods from the literature that are based on uh, 
on uh, deep learning and these are the the state of the art results uh, at the time and uh, we show that uh, our approach um, is um, better uh, in seven out of the eight subsets and also considering the overall uh, metric um, okay and when we also consider cross domain results so there is also this um, setting in which you train the model on uh, one data set and evaluate it on the other data set and uh, you can do this without any fine tuning to the target data set and you can also do it by taking uh, 10 data samples uh, until 100 data samples from the target domain and um, as you fine tune your model on the target domain you can obtain some slight improvements so um, the results here once again we compared with the uh, methods that presented cross-domain results these other two uh, did not uh, report results in this uh, challenging setting and once again here we obtain improvements and in most cases these are uh, significant okay so this proves that uh, the matter method works uh, quite well and we also uh, presented at uh, uh, NACL 2019 another approach based on uh, uh, word embeddings and this approach is based on the uh, vector of locally aggregated descriptors or vlad that was uh, proposed as an extension of the bag of uh, visual words and we also tried to uh, change and adapt this model for uh, word embeddings so in this approach in the vector of local uh, of locally aggregated word embeddings we learn a codebook of representative meta words so these are also learned with k-means and um, once we, we learn these, uh, these word embeddings, we uh, consider each uh, code word um, that is the center. So each code word is the center of the, the corresponding cluster. So um, then what we do, so for each uh, word embedding uh, XT, we uh, look uh, at the corresponding cluster uh, so uh, the, the embedding is as associated to, to the cluster um, uh, that has the minimum uh, Euclidean distance so L2 is the Euclidean distance and then for uh, each document D and each code word uh, uh, mu i we consider the differences uh, between um, uh, the word embeddings XT and the uh, uh, cluster centroid or the co code word mu i um, of the vectors that uh, uh, or of the word yeah the word vectors uh, that are in uh, in the clusters uh, CI and in the document and uh, we accumulate these uh, vectors into uh, into this vector of differences denoted by V of I and D and um, so this is obtained as the difference between the vector XT uh, and the vector mu I so um, this is uh, the difference between uh, two vectors is also a vector so uh, here we obtain a bunch of vectors depending how many words uh, from the document D uh, belong to cluster CI and uh, we take all these uh, difference uh, these uh, vectors of differences and we compute their average obtaining uh, a single vector with all the differences so um, for each cluster centroid we obtain uh, these vectors so for each code word we obtain these vectors V of I and D and then we can um, 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 linearize um, so we just concatenate all these vectors and we obtain the representation for uh, for a document 
So, uh, yeah, this is uh, an alternative approach to the classic bag of visual words. So, um, until this step, you have the same preprocessing. So, you take an imp uh, all the input documents, you tokenize them, you extract word embeddings, then you do the k-means clustering just as before. And now, for example, uh, for the uh, red cluster, you have uh, some words um, that uh, go into this cluster and we take the difference from, uh, so here you see that uh, we have, let's say, this word um, and this cluster centroid and we take the difference um, and the difference is uh, represented here. And actually this is the average distance uh, or the sum of all the differences in the in the vocabulary uh, of uh, words that appear in this cluster and in this document. So yeah, basically you intersect the document with the cluster. So you have some uh, words here in yellow that uh, fall in this cluster. So you compute the difference between the centroid and every word here and um, you uh, sum up the differences and you obtain this vector. So this is, uh, you, you obtain a vector for every cluster centroid and then you concatenate these vectors and you obtain the final representation of a document. So this is equivalent to the vector of local, locally aggregated descriptors. And here we show results on uh, five different uh, corpora uh, so the, mm, these three are mm, commonly used to, to show the performance of, uh, uh, of uh, document embeddings. And here we have the bag of words uh, baseline that is uh, uh, actually based on words. The continuous bag of words or the average of word embeddings also are used as a baseline and other methods uh, that are proposed in literature such as paragraph vectors um, and other methods based on uh, autoencoders, um, uh, skipgram models and naive base, uh, bidirectional LSTMs with attention um, um, and other representations based on glove and so on. So here we see that um, in, on this data set we obtain the best results and also on these other two. And uh, here we have the third best results on these two data sets. So that the method performs pretty well and compares uh, favorably to all these, um, most of these methods from the, from the literature. Okay, so this seems to be the last slide. So, yeah, I was thinking that uh, uh, I will not finish in time and I try to go through the presentation as fast as possible. So, yeah, if you think I should clarify some points, please uh, let me know and uh, uh, ask questions. So I will uh, answer in the remaining time. Okay, so today also maybe until you ask your questions, um, I checked the, the uh, calendar and it seems that uh, next uh, Thursday is uh, the first uh, day of vacation. So there will uh, be no, uh, no lectures on next Thursday. Uh, Thursday. So uh, the next lecture will be on uh, January 7th. So um, that I think will be also our last lecture. So um, maybe in the second week, we will allocate the time for uh, presenting the projects. Um, okay, so yeah, if you have questions, just uh, please write them down in the chat and I will try to, to answer. Um, so do not wait for, uh, for me to answer the previous question. So just to save some time, uh, because of the delays. Um, to a language model encoding, I'm not sure what the language model encoding is. So, um, 
Yeah, so these are basically state-of-the-art approaches. So, yeah, if a language model encoding is not uh, in here, it means it uh, it's not state-of-the-art. Yeah, just to give a short... Okay, so, okay, that's... Um, okay, so this is a BERT, okay. Okay, so for BERT, um, actually BERT was a concurrent submission of the time, so BERT was also presented at uh, NACL 2019. And uh, yeah, these approaches uh, are all based on these data sets, so they do not use any external data. So if you do uh, want to do an apples to apples comparison with BERT, uh, it's not possible, I think. Um, so if you try to train BERT only on these uh, data sets, I think you will not have enough data to, to obtain a good model. So BERT is usually trained on very large corpora and uh, at least the pre-training pre part. So um, it really takes advantage of the availability of uh, large corpora. So um, it can obtain better results. So I think I'm not sure for exactly these, uh, um, these data sets, uh, if there are uh, results reported, I think they, they reported the results maybe on, uh, on other corpora, but um, yeah, if you, there are some head to head comparisons and you obtain uh, better results with uh, BERTs or uh, similar word embedding approaches, but those are based on, uh, uh, those are based on, uh, um, yeah, using uh, significantly more data than uh, all these uh, approaches here. Okay, so yeah, a comparison, uh, perhaps at the moment, uh, a comparison would be useful, but at the time, uh, as I said, this was a concurrent submission. So uh, uh, a comparison would not have been possible. Okay, so yeah, in the tables, we have the classification accuracies, so all these are classification tasks. So this is categorization by topic. Uh, sentiment analysis, these two. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, so this is uh, classifying sentences into subjective and objective. And I think this one is about question categorization or question answering, I don't know, but it's still the classification accuracy. So for this one, I have six classes uh, these are binary classification tasks. This is also binary, I think. And this one is uh, has 90 categories. So all these are uh, classification accuracy rates. Okay, so yeah, for more details, you can also check the papers in the slides. So for each paper, you have the, the title and these are all available um, uh, online so um, of course you can uh, go and check the papers for uh, all these approaches so yeah, you have the paper of the title the authors and the publication uh, for um, yeah, all the works and um, they should be available uh, as open access so you can find all these papers online um, and check all the details in the papers. Um, yeah, so, okay, so there is fine tuning. So uh, the embeddings are obtained in an unsupervised way using k-means. And once you obtain the document representation, you uh, train a classification model on top of it. So, of course, there is some supervised uh, uh, supervised method on top of that. Uh, yes, so for the 
uh, skip thought vectors and paragraph vectors i think you can trade them uh, train them um, for the task so you can slightly adapt the representation and uh, the same can be done for other approaches um, but this is not possible for um, uh, the bag of super word embeddings so that that's that is because the approach is a, a handcrafted approach <clears throat> Okay, so I think we have uh, uh, we have um, we had a nice uh, session of question and answering. Um, yeah, it seems that there are no other questions for me to answer, and nobody else tried to ask questions besides uh, Mate. So. Um, Yeah, so, mm, so not sure the question, the last question, what is that about? Um, so what I can say is that if you use a BERT model um, and you give it as input a sentence, it will give you as output uh, an embedding for every word in the sentence. So you can use the average of word embeddings to represent that sentence for a downstream task, uh, for a downstream model. So, um, yeah, you can use, let's say, a pre-trained uh, BERT model. Um, you pass sentences through the model and you take the word embeddings uh, for the words uh, of that sentence. You average them and you obtain a document embedding. And then you can use that um, in a uh, in a supervised classification model. Um, I think this doesn't make too much sense. So I think yeah, BERT has its own uh, integrated way of building word embeddings. So yeah, I don't think it makes sense to to provide word to vec embeddings to BERT because BERT does its own uh, word embeddings. Uh, but what you can do is you can obtain a document level embedding from the word embeddings uh, that are given as output by BERT. And um, yeah, I think you can also fine tune the model, the BERT with the uh, model for the downstream task in order to obtain some slight improvements there. And this is, of course, if you can train the, the BERT model because you need perhaps a powerful GPU to train it. Okay, so... Uh, I think we can uh, end the lecture here. So I'll take this opportunity to wish you guy, uh, guys a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, we will see each other again in uh, January on uh, Thursday 17. Um, okay, so one more question. What about performance? Performance of what? Um, so it depends on the method. So if you want to use word to vec and also on the data set so word to vec and uh, glove are lightweight models and it shouldn't take too much time to train 
but for uh, BERT um, it can take uh, significantly more time to, to train. Um, yeah, so I think the original BERT model was trained uh, for weeks on powerful Google GPUs and um, yeah, it's, maybe it's not uh, that everyone can fine-tune a BERT model uh, for their task unless they have a, a GPU to, to use. But the advantage is that you can use the pre-trained model with fairly good results. So uh, there is also this option to use BERT and uh, then apply some uh, uh, multi-layer perceptron on top of it or LSTM or something else to, to obtain uh, uh, fairly good results without having to, to retrain or find you on the model. Okay, so uh, thank you for participating and uh, yeah, see you guys uh, next year. <coughs>